thank, thank you very much, uh, Heather, and thanks to all of you for coming out on this, on this raw evening. Um, and thanks to you, Joe, for, for being here. Uh, I, I remember very, very clearly my first encounter with, with, uh, with Joe. Joe doesn't remember anything about this. Um, it was in 1974. I was graduating from the alma mater we share, which was Amherst College. And in that year, Joe um, got an honorary degree. You were at the ripe old age of 31. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember sitting in the audience watching Joe come up across the, 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 the podium and being hooded with your, the, 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 uh, uh, the honors of, of, of your honorary doctorate. And um, uh, a, a friend of mine just elbowed me and just said, Joe, who? This was in 1974 at a time when we were all hoping that there'd be perhaps a rock star up there. <laughs> and of course, the irony is that there was. And, uh, and, it, and it was you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Joe, as you all know, is, is the winner of the Nobel uh, Prize in Economics. Uh, during the Clinton administration, he was the chairman of the Council uh, of Economic Advisor, Advisors, and then he went on to become the chief economist of the World Bank. Uh, he is probably the only person in the world who can say he's both a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and a contributor to Vanity Fair. <laughs> uh, during the past 10 years, he has emerged as one of the chief critics of the way we've managed globalization. Of the, and of the cadre of economists that, that you call free market fundamentalists. Uh, and even before the economic meltdown, uh, Joe was a scourge of the way Wall Street does business. Over the years, he has, inquired, uh, he has acquired an enviable roster of intellectual antagonists. <laughs> but the epithet that he may have the most trouble living down is the New York Observers, which called him Columbia's cuddliest economics professor. <laughs> But one has to wonder about the, the competition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I have I have some questions for Joe. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take it for about a, for, uh, the conversation for about a half an hour, and then um, then turn it uh, over to questions from all of you. And then um, Joe will sign books, and then he will be off to uh, to Davos. So um, so let's begin with the situation that we the that we uh, find ourselves in now which is at the very heart of pre-fall. Um, uh, so if you could take a stab, give us a, the executive summary, you know, the five-minute version of how did we get into this mess? Well, if I had uh, one word, I'd say the banks. Um, the, the, the obviously, the financial system undertook excessive risk. Uh, the banks didn't do what they were supposed to do, which is to allocate capital, manage risk, run a payments mechanism and do it all at low transaction cost. They didn't do any of that. They misallocated capital. They mismanaged risk. They created risk. Uh, and they charged uh, huge transaction costs to the point where 40% uh, of all corporate profits were in the financial sector. So in a sense, we confused uh, a financial system is supposed to be a means to an end, and we thought of it as an end in itself. Now, there's a lot of debate about uh, the causes uh, of the crisis. Uh, a lot, you know, a lot of blame to go around. And even when you identify something uh, like the banks uh, and say they were the cause, you have to ask the question, why? So, because, you know, uh, capitalism isn't supposed to be dysfunctional in the way that it was. So when I look at the banks, uh, I say, well, the fundamental problem was incentives. Um, the one thing that economists agree on is that incentives matter. And at the individual and organizational level, incentives were distorted, incentives for excessive risk taking. And then you have to ask, well, why were those incentives? Why, capitalism is supposed to have good incentives. Why do we have such bad incentives? Uh, and to keep answering those questions, you'll have to buy the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other, you know, the, the regulators uh, were supposed to stop them. They didn't, and you have to ask why. One of them is we uh, we we stripped away the regulations during during uh, for a, over a long period of time, including in the period of the Clinton administration. Uh, part of the problem was we appointed regulators who didn't believe in regulation. So if you have regulators who don't believe in regulation, uh, for them, doing their job was doing nothing. And they did that very well. Um, the 
Um, sometimes there, there, there's a, a blame on the Fed. Uh, right now, Bernanke is up for for reappointment, and a lot of people are are saying, "Why should we appoint somebody who?" Uh, brought the financial system uh, to the edge of ruin, and they point out that low interest rates helped feed the bubble, and the bubble was part of the problem. Well, my, my criticism uh, is a little bit different. Uh, if our financial system had been working well, low-cost capital could have been the basis of a boom. I mean, what kind of a firm complains that workers were willing to work at too low of a wages, and that's why I lost money. And the banks are complaining that the Fed gave them capital at too low of a cost, and that's why they messed up. Now, you know, on the face of it, it seems like a really bad argument. And we've had periods with low interest rates in which we haven't had problems, and countries have had high interest rates in which they have. The real problem was the financial sector failed, and the Fed didn't stop them. That's really what I think of as, as the uh, core of the problem. And part of the reason, and this brings me by, to the final blame, um, they got caught up in this mark of fundamentalism. Uh, they believed that there couldn't be such a f thing as a bubble because that would be evidence that markets were inefficient and we know that markets are efficient. Uh, they went on to say, even if there were a bubble, there's nothing we could do. Uh, and besides, it's easier to clean up the mess uh, than to try to interfere with the efficiency of the almighty economy. Now, each of those propositions uh, I think was absurd at the time. And I think in retrospect, it's clearly been uh, absurd. The economics profession, I think, bears some blame for the problem because they were the intellectual uh, armor that the regulators and the bankers used to justify a lot of what they did. I want to come back to the economics profession in just a couple of minutes, but, but first, can we just pause on, on one part of what you were talking about, and that is on regulation. So you were there in the Clinton administration for a lot of these battles, and, and in fact, you're, you're, among the things you're famous for, you're famous for some of the battles you lost. Uh, you're kind of the Robert E. Lee of economics. And, uh, the, uh, and one of those battles was the Glass-Steagall uh, uh, Act, uh, which was repealed during the Clinton administration. Um, and I wonder if you could just give us a, a quick resume of what, first of all, what Glass-Steagall was, and then what your position was, and then what happened. Uh, so first let me make clear, while I was there, they didn't repeal it. So it was a battle that was lost after I left, but it was a battle that was fought very, very intensely while I was there. Glass-Steagall was a law that was passed in the aftermath of the Great Depression when they looked around and said, what caused the problems? And it attempted to separate out commercial banks, which take ordinary citizens' money and are supposed to manage it conservatively, because when you will go to the bank, you want to be sure to be able to get your money back. When you put your money in the ATM and it says insufficient funds, you want it to be because you have insufficient funds in your account, not because the bank has insufficient <laughs> funds. So uh, that was the spirit. They didn't have ATMs at the time, but, but that was the spirit. To separate out that commercial bank from the investment bank that take high-income individuals' money and gamble. And sometimes they win and sometimes they lose, but those people can afford it. So that was the spirit of what we had, uh, of, 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 of that. And we had banks like Goldman Sachs that were investment banks and Citibank that were, that were commercial banks. The battle was, uh, particularly centered around Citibank, uh, to put it, some names on this, Bob Rubin had been head of Goldman Sachs, and after he left the Clinton administration, he became uh, one of the chief people in uh, Citibank. And the idea was that you wanted to make Citibank uh, bring in all these, a supermarket of financial services. So you had to get rid of these rules that separated uh, the institutions. Now, I argued uh, that there were several problems. First, 
there were problems of conflicts of interest uh, that if you're running an investment bank, you could take easy access to money and use it for other purposes. Uh, and those conflicts of interest became quite evident in the world common Enron scandals in the earlier part of, the, of this decade. Uh, the second one is that there really were two different mentalities. You wanted uh, your commercial banks to be conservative, to, to put it somewhere. You want banking to be boring. And the investment banks liked the excitement of gambling. And those two cultures, you mix them together, the risk was that the risk-taking culture would contaminate the conservative culture. And the third problem was one of concentration. Uh, one of the strengths of America's financial system has been uh, that it has been a widely diversified financial system running throughout the United States, uh, not concentrated like many uh, uh, countries in Europe. Um, and there's a worry that when you repealed Glass-Steagall, it would lead to uh, heavy concentration. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the, uh, to the point where uh, the, uh, you know, the largest uh, few banks uh, had 50% or more of all deposits. So our banking system has become very concentrated. One of the worries about very, very big banks is that they become too big to fail and also too big to be managed. And that means you have a double problem. Because they're too big to be managed, they ought to fail. But because they're so big, they can't be allowed to fail. And that's exactly uh, what happened. There was one other aspect of the debate that you might find amusing, which was um, on the issue of conflict of interest, uh, Treasury and the advocates said, uh, don't worry, we'll create Chinese walls. And my response was two, uh, you know, uh, twofold. One, first of all, I don't trust you <laughs> that uh, you'll create Chinese walls that are very low and you'll walk over them. Uh, and what I trust is that you'll do what's in your interest, which is what they did, uh, but not in the interest of the rest of our country. But the second point was that if they did create these high, trust, uh, high Chinese walls, then why bring these companies together? You know, if they, if they aren't going to interact, well, keep them separate so you don't have the potential for conflict of interest. They never gave a good answer. And uh, um, as I say, it, after I left uh, towards the end of the decade, uh, when Citibank was being formed, they finally uh, repealed Glass-Steagall. But I, I should point out, it was a long-run objective of the financial uh, uh, institutions. Some people argue uh, that you know one of the mysteries is, uh, why was Paul Volcker not reappointed as uh, chairman of the Fed? An interesting issue, uh, given that we're now talking about reappointment of the Fed, because he did what a central banker is supposed to do. That is to say, we had had double-digit inflation. He brought it down. Um, and normally, having really managed the macro economy, you would have thought he would have gotten, you know, triple uh, A grade, A++, and been reappointed. But he wasn't by Reagan. And the reason was that he believed that there was a role for regulation. And President Reagan looked around for somebody who didn't believe in regulation. And he found somebody who didn't believe in regulation. And, and I'm going to ask you about that individual <laughs> in, just a, in just a couple of minutes. Um, so Joe, let's, let's uh, just fast forward to the, to the present um, or to uh, a year ago. We have the implosion of Bear Stearns. We have the, the problems with Fannie and Freddie and with Lehman Brothers and with AIG. And, Suddenly, we have a, a, a snowballing economic crisis, and then a new administration uh, comes in. Now, you've been critical of what the administration has done. And my question to you, and a, again, just the executive summary version, um, the, uh, uh, if you had been in the driver's seat, what would we have done? Well, and what would we have not done? Yeah. Um, what the administration did was a welcome relief from what we didn't do in the previous administration. 
But much of what it did was too small and not designed in the way I would have done if I had been in the driver's seat. Let me go through the three, three or four issues. Uh, the first was stimulus. Uh, we needed a much bigger stimulus, and we needed a stimulus that was better designed, for instance, um, uh, helping the states. They have a balanced budget framework. They're cutting back. Uh, in California, uh, state workers, including at the university, are being furloughed two days a month. You know, we, people who, who can't get a job, young people want to go to school, but there's a cutback in, in, in community colleges and, and colleges. It doesn't make any sense. So I would not have had uh, the tax cut because we knew from Bush's tax cut with this overhang of debt and a lot of job uncertainty, a lot of that money would not be spent. And the nature of a stimulus is to stimulate the economy, you have to spend. So uh, uh, we needed, as I say, a better design and much larger stimulus. Second thing, uh, it had been clear during the uh, Bush era that we were pouring all of this money, $700 billion, into the banks, but we weren't doing anything about the mortgages. And to me, that was like giving a mass blood transfusion to a patient suffering from internal bleeding without doing anything at the underlying problem. So finally, uh, Obama did something about mortgages, but it was too little. And the result of it is the uh, magnitude of the number of, of mortgages going into foreclosure is actually expected to be higher in 2010 than it was in 2009 and 2008. We expect about two and a half to three and a half million people are losing their homes this year, and with it, many of them will be losing their life savings, and we have a social problem as well as, a, as an economic problem. The main mistake that was done there was the underlying problem, which those in the financial sector did not want to own up to, is they had made bad loans on the basis of bubble prices. And the bubble crashed, so a quarter, a quarter of all Americans owe more money on their homes than the value of their house. They have negative equity. Well, if you don't write down the value of the equity somehow, or deal with this problem somehow, there's just going to be more and more foreclosure. We're just stretching out the problem. They're refinancing, generating more fees for the banks, but meaning that the debts are still there. The third problem uh, was the banks themselves. And here there were two problems. One, when we poured money uh, into the banks, we didn't have any vision of what kind of a financial system we wanted. Some parts of the financial system do what they're supposed to do. They lend money to small and medium-sized enterprises, provide for finance for new enterprises like the venture capital firms. Some parts of the financial system are engaged in gambling. We should have poured money into those that were lending. Instead, we poured money into the gamblers. Uh, another mistake that we made was, you know, when we reformed uh, the welfare bill in 1996, what we said is to the poor people who went on welfare, we said, if you're going to go on welfare, we're going to put conditions. You have to look for a job or you have to go into training. When the banks went on welfare, and that's what they did, when we were giving $700 billion, this is a much bigger welfare program than we ever provided for the poor. When the banks went on welfare, we didn't put any conditions. So as we were pouring money into them, they were pouring money out in the form of dividends, bonuses, buying other healthy banks. No wonder that credit didn't, didn't, uh, didn't increase. So they didn't do their, their critical function. And the final mistake that we made with respect to the banks was we didn't address the underlying problem of incentives and regulations. Uh, what uh, the president proposed in June was inadequate. And the, I, I feel very relieved that in the last two weeks, he's recognized that that was a mistake. And finally, the proposal to do something about the too big to fail banks, the proprietary trading, uh, which is a kind of uh, conflict of interest, uh, excessive risk taking, finally begun to do something about uh, these regulatory issues. Um, of course, you weren't in the driver's seat. And 
Um, one of the things that you that you write about, and uh, and I, I found this to be especially fascinating because it's not it's not so much part of the conversation, and yet it's not hard to see that it could become part of the conversation. Has to do with the impact abroad, and I don't mean the you know the the, uh, the cascade of economic consequences. What I mean is the cascade of of mental and intellectual consequences. So the the, the American way of doing business has for for decades and longer been uh, a model for, for many people in the world. Um, now people are looking at that model and, and perhaps turning away from it. They're turning away from the way we conduct our business as a liberal democracy and, uh, and turning away from, uh, or perhaps turning away from uh, reliance on free markets as something that's, that's desirable. Um, to what extent do you see that as a problem looking down the road? Oh, I think it's a very serious problem. And you might, you might say that there's a positive side to this, which is um, they, they are much more skeptical of uh, blindly accepting advice from outsiders. Um, you know, uh, we sold our policies, our institutions as good institutions, good policies. We told countries around the world you know, for instance, to imitate our central bank. But in fact, the central banks in India, Brazil, China did a much better job than the Fed. And uh, that has given them, you might say, new confidence, which I think is a good thing, but it also has totally undermined our credibility. And, you know, I think making it all the worse in many of the developing countries is the contrast between the way we responded to the crisis here and what the IMF and the US Treasury told countries to do in the East Asia crisis, for instance, just over a decade ago. And you know, the contrast is just so stark. When the US Treasury, and some of the same people, by the way, the US Treasury and the IMF went into Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, and then the, other countries and told them in a moment of crisis, cut back expenditures, balance your budget, raise interest rates. And when I say raise interest rates, I mean, you know, really raise interest rates to 25, 50 percent or more. Uh, don't bail out your banks. Let them go. They went into Indonesia, shut down 16 banks and said, by the way, more are going to go. Caused a panic in Indonesia, a little bit like Lehman, some of the same people, again, doing the same thing. But the contrast between the expansionary fiscal policy, large deficits, very low interest rates, and the massive bailouts, uh, I can tell you when I go to Asia, y you can feel the resentment. You know, they haven't forgotten this. And they say, you know, this is all hypocrisy. And, and the respect with which they hold our leaders uh, and our institutions is 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 really plummeted. You know, uh, a few minutes ago, you you brought up the role of the economics profession in what we've been going through. And one of the uh, there's actually a chapter devoted to this in 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 Freefall. Uh, one of the topics you bring up is the need for economics to take a more uh, behavioral turn. That the the reliance on uh, on the uh, on the notion of there being you know, simply on human beings as rational actors is, well, you know, in our own lives, we all know that there's a level at which it becomes absurd. Um, so what would you, what, what is your recipe for the economics profession? Well, I, I guess uh, what I, well, first I would say, you know, we, the economics profession has to recognize that some of the models that have been very dominant in thinking are very badly flawed. You know, the markets are not as efficient. Uh, people are not as rational as we had assumed. You know, uh, uh, it's not just that there was a bubble. I mean, I think we all recognize there was a bubble. But if you start looking at uh, the kinds of mistakes that they made, uh, the kinds of intellectual incoherence, it, it is really mind-boggling. Let me just give you a couple uh, examples. Um, 
one of them is they were very proud about the new products they were innovating. The financial sector was very proud of the new products they were innovating. They thought that that justified their very high salaries, which they were very pleased with. And uh, they uh, argued that it had transformed our economy. But then when it came to using models to assess the risk of these products, they used data from the past, from the recent past. Now, there was an intellectual incoherence there because if their innovations had in fact transformed the world, then that data from before their innovations was irrelevant. In fact, they were right. It had transformed our economy, but for the worse. <laughs> they had uh, just forgot about elementary propositions like uh, when you securitize, you increase problems of what I call you know, asymmetries of information. Um, the whole securitization was based on the premise uh, of the greater fool theory that, that you could create these products and sell them because no one would know how bad they were. And globalization had opened up a global marketplace for fools. And we were very good at ferreting them out all over the world. And this, you know, some of the really interesting stories is how we managed to sell them in, in northern Norway or you know, all over the world. About 40% of all the toxic mortgages were sold abroad. And, you know, and when you think about what would have happened if we hadn't shared our misery uh, with the rest of the world, how bad things would have been here. Uh, so, um, but, but the point is, as they were going through their analysis, they never thought about these problems. Uh, if they had been rational, it would have been obvious. So I think that, that is, these are just one of many examples of, of the sort of cognitive dissonance, the, the lack of coherence, of, of the economic, uh, of, of economic actors and economic models that ignore this reality are obviously going to give wrong predictions. Now, you, you, you've looked a lot at, at uh, hist economic history and what looks so interesting is that historically, we've had bubbles and crashes, manias and panics since the history of capitalism, probably even before that, uh, back in, in Roman times. Um, and there was only one period in our history in which this hasn't, didn't occur. And that was the short period of about 40 years after the Great Depression when we, impo when we had strong regulations before we began the deregulation movement of the 1980s. Uh, but what was so striking is that somehow these so-called social scientists believed that we had changed human nature and that these were all things, these ups and downs, bubbles and manias were things of the historical past, but we have, because we were so smart, uh, we would never be subjected to that kind of, of uh, uh, irrationality. And what's so remarkable is that the only thing was, uh, that was irrational was our belief in rationality. <laughs> So let me take this down, this will be my last question for you, and then I'll turn this over to the audience, but let me take this down to the level of individuals. Now, I told, I told Joe beforehand that I was going to do this, that I was going to ask him, you can see him rolling his eyes, I was going to ask him <laughs> about specific individuals, just to get a, a, just a quick assessment, like what he would chisel on their tombstone. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Joe said uh, uh, that would that was going to get him into trouble, and, and, I, and I said that would be okay. So, um, so Alan Greenspan. Um, well, I, I guess the, the thing I think of first is uh, when uh, the bubble was going, he said, just a little froth. And uh, here was uh, a person who believed in efficient markets who told Americans, to go out and get variable rate mortgages that subjected them to more volatility. Again, it's an example of this kind of intellectual incoherence. If you believe in efficient markets, on average, you can't save money by going to one form of mortgage or another because markets have arbitraged that out. 
But going to one form of a mar mortgage or another does affect the risk that you face. And he encouraged them to go to the riskiest form of mortgage. He made the observation that when, if people had, had invested in, in these variable rate mortgages 10 years earlier, they would have saved money. The reason was obvious, because market never anticipated market interest rates going down to the 1% that he brought it. But when interest rates are 1%, which way can they go? <laughs> Mostly up. And they should have known that when they took out a 1% mortgage and they borrowed as much as they could, there were problems coming up when interest rates rose, would rise, as they almost inevitably would. So I think this is really a real example of, of almost cognitive dissonance uh, of the kind that I talked about before. Tim Geithner. <laughs> the previous answer didn't get you into any trouble, by the way. Uh, Well-meaning. OK. <laughs> Robert Rubin. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, a, a uh, book about his experience, I think it was something about uh, risk, I forget the exact title, do you remember the exact no. title? Well, anyway, um, he was partly responsible for managing the risk of a, a large complex organization like Citibank that was bigger than anybody could, could really manage, uh, as Paul Volcker said, you know, these banks are too big. Uh, actually uh, to be managed, I think they're too big to be. Um, but the, the point is that understanding risk is not so easy. You have to understand, you know, when you look at where, where the, the banks went wrong, problems of uh, misestimating the probability of price decline, underestimating the degree of correlation, underestimating what we call fat tail distributions, the probability of, of, of these rare events occurring. That requires some statistical sophistication. And unfortunately, so far, most of our law school training doesn't really cut, the, uh, cut, cut, cut it. And so the real question about whether the heads of these large uh, organizations ought to have a little bit more training in risk if they're claiming to be managing risk. Uh, Did I get, out, get through that? You, okay. you said unprepared. <laughs> no. Uh, 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 Lawrence Summers. <laughs> You're really making this difficult. Um, uh, people here know a lot more about Larry than, than, than I do because they, they've well, had we'll to. We'll ask them later. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, they've experienced uh, him uh, firsthand. Um, I guess. Um, uh, you were saying, what, what is the epitaph? One of the things that he claims, I think, as one of his great achievements uh, on his picture at the Fed, at the, at the uh, U.S. Treasury, where he was Secretary of Treasury, was uh, the financial, so-called Financial Modernization Act, which uh, ensured that we not regulate the derivatives. Uh, remember, uh, uh, the head of the uh, commodity, uh, the CFTC, the re which regulates uh, futures markets, had said that we need to regulate these dangerous derivatives. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett had called them weapons of uh, mass financial destruction. Um, after the long-term capital management debacle in which one, pro one firm almost brought down the global financial system, and there was an intervention, massive intervention by the uh, New York Fed. Uh, the head of the CFTC said, you know, boy, do we need regulation of these derivatives. His uh, claim to fame is making sure that government, the regulators would not be allowed to regulate these derivatives. Uh, this failure, this one failure, cost 100, you know, AIG, many, many of you may know that there was a $89 billion bailout. But when you weren't looking, you may not have realized that the government continued and continued to pour money into AIG. So that the total now is around $180 billion. 
dollars. And you think about what that amount, what that means. That's equal to the total aid from all the developed countries to all the developing countries over a two-year period. It represents the total aid to Africa, for instance, over a quarter of a century. That went to one firm. It then went on to, you know, that money went through them to people like uh, 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 Goldman Sachs. One of the concerns, of course, is that the way this bailout was done, that was a consequence of um, these derivatives, was done in a very non-transparent way really undermining, I think, uh, democratic processes. Uh, uh, the Fed has um, said that it's not subject to the Freedom of Information Act or won't respond. New, uh, Bloomberg has had to sue. Uh, Bloomberg won the suit, and the Fed is appealing. So uh, there's a little bit of a long answer to your question, but- We'll get a bigger tombstone. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think of all of these as the derivative consequences of not regulating derivatives. Well, I feel very strongly that we need a second round of a stimulus. Uh, the, the economy remains very weak. One, almost one out of five Americans who would like a full-time job cannot get one right now. Um, the unemployment among certain groups is, is horrendous. Uh, among Afro-American youth, the official unemployment rate is almost one out of two. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have some really serious problems in the strength of our economy. And the, the issue, some people say, well, we're growing. Uh, employment always lags behind growth. The fact is the growth isn't fast enough for the new entrants into the labor force, and it's not likely to be so for uh, this year, ne next year. Uh, and we'll be lucky if we don't do something to get unemployment down to six, five, six, seven percent by 2012 or thir uh, 2013. So um, very strong supporter of a second round of stimulus, focusing in part on uh, the uh, helping the states, the, I mentioned that before, also focusing on investments. Because one of the concerns that's being raised all over the country is what about the size of the deficit and the national debt? It, it, it is a source, source of concern. But if you spend money on investments that yield a return, then in fact, the long run national debt can actually be lower. And the break-even point for reasonable values under reasonable assumptions is only about 6%. So as long as we can get 6% return, real return on our investments, the long-term national debt is lowered. And the returns on investments in infrastructure, education, technology are well in excess of that. I mean, first, uh, you're, you're absolutely uh, right that the uh, rating agencies did a miserable job Part of the reason they did a miserable job was that their incentives were, were distorted. Uh, uh, they were paid by the investment banks that were producing the rotten products. And so they had incentives to give them a good grade. And uh, as I said before, w what economists believe is that incentives matter. Uh, but you're also absolutely right, getting uh, good models is difficult. But one way of thinking about this, when uh, engineers build a bridge, they know that they don't have exactly the, 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 the uh, uh, structural properties, and so they overbuild. They assume that it can withstand two, three, four, five times the weight that they're designing it for. So the answer to that is you don't try to push the system to the edge, which is what our banks were trying to do. They were trying to push it to the edge. Now, having said that, I think the risk analysis of the banks and the credit rating agencies was unforgivably miserable. Uh, as I said before, they just let me give you one example. They assumed that the likelihood of a decrease in the price of a home in different parts of the country at the same time was very low. What they forgot was there's a common factor throughout our country 
called monetary policy. And if interest rates go up, as well they would from the 1% level to a more normal level, it would have an impact on housing markets throughout the country. And that's precisely what happened. So my, you know, if they had just taken an elementary macro course at a good university, they would have learned about this. Well, um, the reason, the, the question that those who didn't hear was, was that state regulation of insurance is state by state and there's some venue shopping for, for uh, the lowest, uh, the least regulated uh, uh, insurance uh, regulator. Um, our insurance regulation is uh, archaic. You know, we have a national market and uh, you can buy insurance products over the internet. So uh, that means, you know, what might have been true in a world where you had to deal with the salesman is no longer true under modern technology and we really ought to move towards a national regulatory system. Uh, that having been said, uh, the, the systemic risk posed by the insurance industry is much less, but not zero, much less than uh, uh, by the banks. AIG uh, problem were really not because of the insurance part of AIG. It was the AIG's derivatives and how AIG's derivatives interacted with our banking system. So AIG as an insurance company did not cause our problem. It was AIG as uh, in the derivative markets in this un unregulated market that I talked about before. Uh, let me ask, answer the second part first because it's really important to understand why the economy is so weak and likely to remain weak. Uh, what sustained the American economy in the years before the crisis was this housing bubble which allowed people to uh, consume. And we were really good at consuming. Uh, as a country, uh, we were living beyond our means. Uh, households, the average savings rate went down to zero. And when the average rate savings rate is zero, that means a lot of people have negative savings. We're living beyond their, their means. Uh, it was all possible because they believed that they were going to be rich because their house price was going to soar. Now, reality has intruded. Savings rate in the United States historically have averaged about 7%. Um, a zero savings rate is not sustainable, and I think it would be a mistake to want us to go back to the zero savings rate. Uh, it's not good for our country in the long run, uh, particularly given the demographics, the aging, uh, uh, the, pro the, the, the aging of our population. Um, because of the loss of retirement wealth, the ho loss of housing wealth, there are even, uh, it's even possible that the number, the savings rate will go beyond 7%. But that is what presents a real problem because if people aren't spending, there's a lack of aggregate demand and the economy is going to be weak. In the short run, the government stepped in but that has meant the government has gone from spending, from the households have gone from spending based on borrowing to the government spending on the basis of borrowing. That's okay if it's for investment. And that's the critical point. If we invest, we're investing in the future, we can stimulate our economy we, and, and get a return. It's particularly true because our economy needs to uh, invest enormous amounts of money to adapt to the problems of climate change. And this is where I think there was a really big mistake made in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, if at Copenhagen there had been an agreement that, that the, uh, on climate change, it would have led to the price of carbon emissions going up. I mean, we're treating something that's scarce as if it's free. Right now, the price of carbon is zero. Most economists think the price of carbon ought to be around $80 a ton. If we had done that, that would have provided 
kind of uh, um, impetus for a lot of investment in the economy, which would have been good both in the short run and the long run. Now, uh, your uh, first part of your question was, where are the jobs going to be created? It's very difficult to ever predict where jobs are going to be created, but what we do know is if we have enough aggregate demand, the market will answer that question. But there are lots of obvious things, and there are some things that we ought to be moving towards. I mean, the obvious thing is our green jobs that I've just been mentioning. That's, that's one thing. But let me give you another example. Um, there is uh, uh, a lot of concern. A lot of the jobs that have been lost have been in manufacturing. And there is a, a general sense that we'll never get those jobs back. The general view is that an advanced industrial country like the United States can't compete in manufacturing. Well, I think that's wrong. You look at Germany, which has been the largest exporting country in the world, is very competitive in manufacturing. But they spend a lot of money on training, on research and technology in a way that we don't. So the lesson for that is that if we're going to create the jobs and we're high-wage jobs and we're going to be competitive, we have to invest in technology, education, some of the other things that I was talking about before. There's been a lot of support uh, in the last year or two for a what is called a Tobin tax, which is a financial service transaction tax. Uh, uh, France has actually passed one on the condition that other countries will do it. Uh, you might say that was a cheap shot, knowing that uh, others wouldn't. Uh, but uh, a lot of support in Germany and the UK. Uh, US has been one of the countries that's been a, a big holdout. Um, the basic principle is one that I think is, is pretty clear. It's trying to discourage a lot of the short-term volatility, short-term transactions, which serve no uh, we show very little social purpose, but do lead to increased volatility, and there are large social costs to this volatility. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, interestingly, um, uh, not only have I, but Larry Summers have written on why this is a good idea. That was Larry Summers before he became Secretary of Treasury. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the only question and it remains a subject of a lot of debate, and it is uh, the financial sector is very good at tax evasion and tax avoidance. And there are two principles in taxation. One is it's a good thing to tax bad things rather than good things. So it's a good thing to tax pollution. It's a good thing to tax destabilizing financial transactions. So that's the positive. The negative thing is it's a bad thing to, ta to impose taxes that are easily evaded and avoided because circumvention has a huge cost. Some of my friends in financial markets say that they believe they could design a tax that cannot be circumvented. And these are guys who are very good at uh, creativity in the financial markets. Uh, others believe that in practice when we delegate it to the people who will be doing it, they will find up, uh, come up with a tax structure that will be uh, easily to, easy to circumvent. So Joe, let me just wrap up with, with one final question. I don't know how many of you uh, drove in here listening to NPR, um, but there was, um, uh, they featured a rap song uh, with <laughs> characters playing the parts of John Maynard Keynes and F.A. Hayek. And so my question is, are you following this up with a rap video? <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you think uh, it would be a good idea, <laughs> anything to get these ideas out there. <laughs> yeah, well. Joseph Stiglitz, thanks so much. You've been terrific.